Hi, Monty Powell here on behalf of G1 Oncology Now. Today we're going to be talking about updates in kidney cancer with three of my dear friends. We're going to start with a quick round of introductions, beginning with you, Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Suarez. I'm a medical oncologist at Bideburn Hospital in Barcelona, Spain. Dan? Hi, folks. Dan George from Duke. I'm a GU medical oncologist and happy to be part of the panel. Awesome. Brad? Yeah, and I'm Brad McGregor, also a GU medical oncologist from Dana-Farber in Boston. Awesome. All different parts of the world here. Monty Powell from Los Angeles, California, and we're going to dive right in. Um, so first topic is frontline therapy. Um, you know, we've got lots of choices now in 2023. Um, if we kind of whittle it down to maybe the top four, Axipembro, Cabo-Nevo, Lenpembro, nevo Ipi. let's just get right down to it. Dan, how do you kind of pick amongst those for your patients? Yeah, it's hard. You know, there's no four-sided coin, is there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the reality is, is that there's a number of factors that we think about when we're assessing our patients for frontline therapy. And some of these are really around the disease, right? Mm -hmm. their, their IMDC score, um, you know, the, the, the pace of this disease, the volume of disease, uh, symptoms that the patients may have, and their functional status. And then some of this, I think, has to do with the, the patient, you know, and sort of what their, you know, preferences are. We go over sort of these mechanisms and the side effect profiles because they're different. You know, when we talk about TKIs and IO therapy, you know, it's, it's a little bit more of a, of a chronic side effect profile. We think about our IO, IO options, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a little bit more, a little bit less toxicity, but when we do see toxicity, it can be a little bit longer lasting and harder to reverse. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of trade-offs with this. Most of the time, the patients are really looking to me to tell them what to do. And so, really, I'm kind of sharing with them my thought process and why I'm choosing an IO, IO regimen or why I might be choosing an IO, TKI regimen. And I would say, you know, for my more intermediate risk patients, patients that uh, I think have the time to go through a line of therapy and if it doesn't work, be able to go on to a second line of therapy. I like that IO IO combination of ipilimumab nivolumab. For my patients that are a little bit more symptomatic and maybe particularly have some higher risk sites of disease, these are the patients where I'm thinking I need a quicker response, I need a more reliable response, and, and where a, a TK IO combination makes sense. And then for the favorable risk patients, some of these patients could be active surveillance even. But for the patients that want to pursue an active therapy up front with the goal of maybe having some time off treatment, get down to minimal disease state. I like, you know, my TK IO to OT combinations in that setting as well. You know, I'm glad you sort of broke it down into risk status, right? I mean, I think it's so critical that we sort of acknowledge the risk status of the patient. You know, Brad, what's your approach to, say, the good risk patient? Uh, generally speaking, are you doing IO IO in that setting, TK IO, others? I actually find the good risk the hardest situation. <laughs> And which you deal with in day because I mean we look at the TKIO combinations. There's certainly a clear benefit in terms of PF, PFS, um, but it's at the expense of toxicity, and you're giving these two drugs for a prolonged, prolonged period of time. And it, I always have that that internal struggle, you know, what we do. And even though Nevo Ipi, that trial, you know, the prime endpoint is intermediate poor risk. Mm -hmm. If you look at the long-term follow-up, that favorable risk is actually numerically improving overall survival. So there's that patience, even with favorable risk, that can have a really prolonged, durable response to the treatment-free interval. We had a nice data from Mike Atkins showing that NEVO alone had this impressive response rate in that favorite disease. So I, I find it to be a very challenging situation in the clinic, and it's probably the longest discussion I have with patients overall. Because you talk about the different benefits. I mean, we were very fortunate to have a trial for a long time that looked at a combination of cabozantinib and belsudafan in like, the treatment-naive patients, and that was like a great option, like double down on the VEGF, with the combination, and I put a lot of patients on that. I mean, had excellent experience that we saw in the data presented at ESMO um, last year. So I do think this is something that really we need to learn more about. I think it, it's a challenging situation. So give us a little synopsis. If you had to sort of estimate in your clinic amongst your good risk patients, how you're treating you know, them by percentage, what percentage you're getting IO, IO, mm -hmm. what percentage you're getting IO monotherapy, what percentage you're getting TKI, IO? Can you give us a good sense of that? So I think the most important thing is, do they actually need treatment? So we know we all have a lot of favorite risk patients that they have like sure. low burden, especially lung disease, like sub-centimeter lung nodules that have been there. You're like, actually they were there before and they're not growing. So I do think a surveillance approach is very reasonable, offering patients that treatment-free interval for sometimes for a prolonged period of time, lung or even pancreatic meds, you know, they can have a very indolent course when they're they're small. So I think the first step is do you actually need treatment? And then once we do reach a point where we are pursuing um, treatment, 
you know, outside of a clinical trial, I think it does come down to that discussion with the patients. And some patients are like, listen, I want my disease to be shrinking. The highest probability I'm going to see my disease look better on the next set of scans than when you go to that TKIO. But it's like, I really want to hope that I don't have to deal with you long term and do that. Then I will, I will think about Nebo IPI and the most favorite for his patients, just given what we know. So it's a controversial topic, isn't it? Whether or not to use IO in that, or IO or IO in that good risk population. Christina, what are your thoughts there for good risk disease? So I, I agree that the, the first decision you have to take is, I mean, I am going to treat the patient or not, so some patients can stay on surveillance for a long time. So, but in, in my humble opinion, once you is, decide to treat the patient, I would go in most of them for an IOTK AI. Since, uh, because I think, um, I don't know, but with these uh, long responders and with these complete responses we're achieving with these combinations that we, we cannot achieve with, with the monotherapy, I don't know if we are curing some patients. So I think the, the response rate is also important. And we know that the, the, the shrinkage and the dip of response is higher with the IOTKI than with the TKI alone. So I want to give the patients the opportunity to be a long responder or a long survivor. So, and another um, kind of tricky thing is that the TKI that was used in all the first line trials are better than sunitinib. So at least you are, you are giving a better TKI than you would give in monotherapy. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think my, my practice pattern, you know, between the two of you probably aligns more so with you, Christina, for that favorable risk population with TKI, IO, if I'm going to give systemic therapy, but, you know, I see reasonable rationale for it, you know, uh, for IO, IO in certain circumstances, especially if you've really counseled that patient well, right, around the implications. It's really that short-term versus long-term, you know, yeah. kind of priorities, right? I mean, the short-term, you definitely see a longer RPFS with that TKI, IO combination, and, and, and you get those responses, right? And you can get down to that sort of minimal disease state. You might get some treatment-free intervals or maybe just IO alone, and, you know, you can kind of play with it a little bit. And yeah. I know that's not necessarily in the guidelines, but for those of us who treat a lot of kidney cancer, you know, we do individualize, you know, our care over time with these patients around those goals. But with the IO, IO combination, you know, when you do get a response in that setting, yeah. Those can be really durable, and you know, on just you know uh, a Nevo alone, and yes, you know, so that's really satisfying too. So I mean, it is sort of like you know a little bit of um, you know short term, long term, and I, and I guess I I tend to be more of the you know I'd like to see that immediate effect. My patients like to see that when disease responds, quality of life goes up, even if they have toxicity. The peace of mind of having that disease under control is really, really, you know, just stabilizing and, and gratifying for those patients. They can put up with that toxicity a lot better. And, it, you know, then, then we just sort of get into that maintenance phase of how we're going to maintain that response longer term. And it's, a, and it's a little bit of a, of a different mentality at that point in time. So, you know, I, I like the TKI-IO combination because it just gives you flexibility in sort of both endpoints, short term and long term. R really well said, Dan. And you're right, the psychology of this is so important, isn't it? Seeing that tumor yeah. shrinkage is really... It's, it's kind of my psychology as well as theirs. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. That, that totally plays yeah. into it. That makes yeah. perfect sense. Uh, great, great point.